So indeed it was, uh, I think in the mid 80s that um, I had some real powerful and clear experiences. In a way I walked through the veil of time space and found myself in infinity. The experience there is an experience of pure, pure bliss in superb clarity. So wherever your awareness goes, if it at all is in action, it guides you into all kind of corners of the universe. And all of a sudden on my screen it appeared there was an image of, of a woman that I knew that was in the same winter sports resort where I was and that she broke her collarbone. And so I said this to the healer, I said, Nellie, she broke her collarbone and she will be here in 15 minutes and she needs a taxi or ambulance to go to the hospital. To make a long story short, after 15 minutes she was there. So then the question came to me, how have I been informed beyond my senses? Afterwards, a few weeks after, I had another experience. I closed my eyes and I found myself in a state of, I mean, unbelievable happiness. You could say bliss. Or when I talk with people, I often try to bridge it to a common experience. So I use the orgasm as a entry point of connecting and say, well, with an orgasm, now imagine that you have an orgasm, but it's not only in your body. It is, it doesn't end at the border of your skin. It goes on and on and in the end, it is not you anymore that experiences it, but it is, it is the experience in itself that experiences itself. And wherever you like to go with your attention, with your awareness, to what kind of form of information you want, it's instantaneously, it is there. Anywhere you go, it's there, where there is no time, no space. So, the experience that I went into lasted zillions and zillions of years, just to use a word to give reference to time and space. So when I came out, I don't remember exactly, but it was 12 or 15 seconds later. So there, in a way, I re-entered time and space. And I re-entered after 12, 15 seconds in lateral sequential learning again. And I found that mankind, what does it do? It goes through experiences like a mule and learn from the experiences and then translates it or makes conclusions to improve life or whatever only based on the lateral experience. The lateral is part of the finite. What mankind fails to do is being in time and space having the opportunity like I had to not only acquire and access information in a lateral way but also get access in a transcendental way. So that's where I came to see that we all have the opportunity to not only live in time and space because anyway we have those bodies now but that we have also the opportunity to reconnect 
with eternity, with the infinite, the infinite where I had those 12 seconds of experience. So of course I came and became interested how to access that and I found indeed when you can allow your brain rhythm to calm down that you come into a field what I would think we would call not to think but allow yourself to be thought. So it's not anymore the ego that's mulling around and playing its game into the finite but you allow in a way God to speak with you so in other words if you're thinking it's from God's side like I try to connect with you but the line is occupied toot, 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 toot. so if you allow yourself to go out of the thinking process and allow yourself to go into that space where you allow yourself to be thought you can get access to information in a non-lateral way. So after having had the experiences, I started to ponder uh, about my experiences and try to find words for myself. Um, to what really happened. And I try to find references in language, in the world, to also be able to communicate about it, to, in a way, approach people and help them to experience, in a way, with me what happened. One thing became very clear to me, and that was Infinity can encompass, inspire and transpire the finite at any given point, being it expressed in space from high subtle fields to the most dense fields, in any location of time, in any identification point of time, infinity is always there. So in other words, as we speak, we, ex we are expressed in time-space images that we can experience through our senses, can measure what externally, internally. But infinity is always there. So the question came up, why do we, by exclusion of infinity, try to express and find words for everything within the finite and exclude infinity? Why? That was one observation. I do not really have the answer, by the way. The second thing, I start to think about human beings. What does human being mean? I would, many people speak about humans, but other people speak about human beings. And perhaps they do that because they are also animal beings. But there is the, a, a being. So I found out that the human is the finite expression of the being. So then I came to ponder about, but by the grace of what does the finite exists. What is it by the grace of which time and space exist? I, as you know, I'm not an academician, I'm not a scientist. I'm very bad at math and physics and chemics and all, all those kind of things. But I found very something very simple, which is resistance. 
If there's no resistance, there is no time space, there's no finite. Resistance in a way to itself. It's a kind of, you would nearly say, a kind of inner resistance. So what, and what is resistance is plus and minus poles, positive and negative, the male principle and the female principle, giving and receiving, thinking as a way to access information, information that what expresses itself in form, and feeling another way of accessing information. Physical power and the power of vulnerability. What we all, all so often consider to be weak. No, vulnerability is a power. And these two pairs that I just described, and of course there are many, many more forms of it, are meant to relate to, non to one another in a dynamic way. Apparently my consciousness needs to learn that what I may think that is a part in reality belongs together. So if I look into it and I can associate with the male and the female together in dynamic balance, I am in that flow. Now what is the meaning of life for me, to me, is to live in that dynamic harmony. So the idea is that I make choices that are in line with that cycle, the cyclical natural law of creation as more as I evolve with my consciousness, I will see how these laws work. So if I am able to make decisions according to these laws, I will experience a wave, which I would call unconditional love. It's basically an experience that relates to the one that I just described what I said, the form of pure bliss or the experience of pure bliss is that I felt love. I felt being loved and I felt that I could love. And in the meantime, I is just a point of reference because I now can speak with you and with people that may watch this little recording, but there in a way is no, no I. It's just a field where the borders of the eye that often is defined by the border of our skin is not there. It's an illusion. If I go down with my brain rhythm, I go out of the field of thought. Thought goes with opinions. It are charged choices that I often make because I take a position. I take something out of the hole. I, in a way, emotionally attach with something. And with that, I'm against something else. But when I'm in a position of pure balance, I don't have an opinion. I just discern. I discern function from dysfunction according to the level of consciousness that I have at that time. And that implies that the choice that I make always serves at that moment the whole and all instead of part of the whole. See? That is the, that's the real point. So I see there's a difference between emotions 
and feelings. In, in a way, I often use the metaphor of a cello or a bass or a violin or whatever. If I am in my own flow and I am in that position, what I earlier said, of allowing to be thought, I'm completely aware it's like the string of the cello is used, there's no opinion, you hear the resonance of the uh, string. The very moment when the problem comes in is when I have an opinion, because it's like a chewing, a block of huge chewing gum on that bass or on the string, and that's why it starts to play false. So what happens, or I be, so this is a form of attachment. There's no flow there. It's a, so that's a kind of block. It's a block. So what happens with the block? All our attention goes to the block. Oh, it's a block. So we miss out on the whole because we start to get opinionated. We get, start to get narrow-minded. We start to be defensive. It's, it's all forms of fear express themselves in emotions. Yeah? So that's where we have a super localized attention that for the moment may be functional as long as you're willing to look at why you have that block. There is always a root, why you have that block. So when your attention goes there, it means the clarity that you allow yourself to be connected with. You connect it to the that problem, that form of fear or emotion, it melts. The very moment that you see the root, you reconnect with basically the infinite and the problem, the chewing gum, dissolves. Back in 1983, I for the first time got audio tapes. Audio tapes of Jerry Jampolsky and later on that together with his later on his wife, Jerry uh, Ryan Cirincioni. And those tapes were based on The Course in Miracles. He's a child psychiatrist, uh, Jerry, and he talks about love. And he said, love is letting go of fear. Where there's fear, there is no love. And where there's love, there is no fear. Then I came, turned back to my infinite experience and I saw resistance. A, what is fear? It's exactly the same as resistance. Push and pull. So I said, well, God, he had fun. He had, a, he had fun when he created the universe because he all put us in the paradox. In a way, through fear, through resistance, matter, We acquired bodies within that matter, human bodies, to go through resistance, through fear, in order to experience love. It's a kind of what I later came to know as a slow school. Because we are confined by choice, I think, to learn laterally and not transcendental. So we in ourselves have velvety shackled ourselves for ages, thousands and thousands of years, to extrapolate past experiences. So the longer we live, the more history we have, the more we have to carry history on our shoulder. While we can, in the meantime, if we do our good practice through, for example, meditation, yoga, whatever serves you, you can, apart from think, 
you can also allow yourself to be thought. So there's nothing wrong with fear. Fear is okay, as long as you see that it can serve you as a stepping stone to love. We come into the finite to learn we need a contrast. Because perhaps otherwise love, unconditional love, is too conceptually. See? So by going into resistance, you can feel the difference. So maybe by, by, by building that experience and live it, you may bring back something after that that you didn't have before you were born. And part of resistance is the phenomena of having senses. If there's no resistance, there are the senses would not be there. So in infinity there are no senses. In infinity there is just a straight, all encompassing, encompassing, if that's a word, isness. Pure being without perception. It is even now uh, when I uh, come to look at it that There is a balance between the plus and the minus, between thinking and feeling, between the physical power and the power of vulnerability and intuition. Now, we have put on a pedestal in the world that what expresses itself through the intellect, that what expresses itself in physical power. So, why through the intellect? Because through words, we in a way externalize internal experiences. But we seem to validify them by the conformation of others. It's not enough anymore itself that what we have as an inner experience is our inner truth. So what is inside of us loses the power of its belief that it is our truth. And in place of that, instead of that, through the external description of the internal, that becomes our truth. Measurement is an externalization of an inside knowing. So basically, for example, when we measure temperature, before there was any measurement of temperature, it, there was just a sensation in a body and on, on the skin and the shifts between these states of experience. So, in stories, people could relate to that. Now, at one stage, there came Mercury in the field. We had thermometers. We could put lines on it and numbers and we could register outside something from the inside. And we can use this example as an 
metaphor of how often we, by outside descriptions that we can relate to, what you call in your book the consensus reality, how with our own power, our own belief system, we immediately go outside to those ways of measuring our description. And so we become in a way addicted to such an extent that it becomes normal. Normal, the norm is outside. But the question is, is it natural? So my inner nature is so clouded by what is normal that it is not is not nearly alive anymore as we all live in urban structures that are basically anthropocentric expressions that are aborted from nature and all the decision makers in the world including me we live there our norm becomes civilization culture that is taken away from nature so it is that my inner nature is not nurtured anymore. So how can we solve it? So the decision makers think they take normal decisions. They're hardly aware that they think all the time and that none of them hardly ever has access to allowing themselves to be thought. What science does, it compares stuff, it orders it, it ranks them, and then it gets a certain validation. Now, whole institutions, big universities or whatever, are built around this way of approaching the truth. Its sister, the intuition, the feeling, like the instantaneous, what I would call the instantaneous getting connected to information internally, there's no institution in the world, or perhaps a few, that helps us to really trust that internal information. Being it in dreams, hunches, or whatever comes to you, it is because, you know, it only becomes valid when we start to externalize it. But then the experience already is over. The experience is not existing anymore. So it's all past work. So. The real now is not validated. And the only thing there is, is the real now. The same with the physical power. So the physical power we have put on the pedestal, and again the power of intuition, or vulnerability, especially vulnerability, without which there is no life possible. Think about creation, think about all the seeds of the earth that start their life on their own. We have to validate the power of our intuition, the power of our vulnerability. We are guided, the humans, seven billion of them, nearly all of them, by the phenomena of scarcity. Economy, the basis of the so-called econo economic science, is based on the assumption that there is scarcity. When there is scarcity, People, when they're scared, they start to fight, they become fearful. So they try to get stuff and exclude others to take it to themselves, to their families, to their village, to their company, to their soccer club or whatever it is. They want to win, they want to have it. There is no scarcity. But we can make a choice of how to compare with care in order to share with care. In our economy, we describe everything in numbers and weights, so in quantities that are physically measurable. So what our attention goes to is to stuff. So food is stuff, all kind of other Articles that we use like cars or bikes or chairs 
it's all stuff. It's there to fulfill needs. It's there to fulfill material needs. But if we talk about fulfillment, I, in the meantime, associate with things about nurturing and nutrition. So that physical stuff is part of our nurturing. But if we see the con concept of nurturing on a wider and deeper level, there is a much larger non-physical component to it. So before we make choices, we, we make choices to buy stuff, we can put a question out if this really helps to nurture our cells, our deeper cells. And I mean in this sense not the ego self, but the soul behind it. From my experience, when I go more into my sheer being, I see I have less need for stuff. That relates, of course, to acknowledging my own inner power and not comparing myself to others. Any form of outside choice of idealism, being it democracy, socialism, communism, or whatever, is a way of helping to frame something based on the fact that we lack our inner power. It assumes that power is not in us, but that we have to believe in an external power, like science does with all their methods. methods. So the whole challenge for us in society is that we, each of us, claim or reclaim our birth rights, and that the old, the real power is not in my mother nor in the, the president of the country nor in my favorite soccer club or Stevie Wonder or whoever but that the real power resides in me having said that that I respect that the real power resides in you, Bernardo, in, in anybody that listens or sees this little video. If we want that internal power to work, the first thing is the recognition that the infinite, or we, each of us, in togetherness with the infinite, have chosen to have that power here. And we Remember that. Remember that. One thing, if five, six, seven, ten years ago, I came to realize when I listened to Noah, an Israeli singer, singing his Christian song, the Ave Maria, a beautiful song, and in that song, there are some wording that opened up in me a very sad um, part of our awareness, which is there is an enormous power, a nurturing power, in silence. And then what made me very sad is, alas, silence does not have an ambassador. If it would have an ambassador, it would disturb itself. But the ambassador needs to speak.
When we look at media or when we look at interaction between people, that the subject always is to talk about a certain form of chaos. There's always a problem at stake. So we have a kind of addiction to describe a form of chaos and then there's a committee or a person or whoever that's going to try and solve the problem. 99% of the news relates to the description of forms of chaos, being it conflicts or anything, wars or misunderstandings. So it was with this awareness that I created several foundations already late in the 80s where I said, let's just look at, for example, healthcare in a different way. Instead of what is not functional, let's focus on what functions and enhance and bring all our energy to what is whole and make the whole bigger. I'm not saying that it's not good to try and find solutions for problems, but when you have a choice of how to use your energy, this is definitely the latter one. It's a very nice option. Because what you have, what I have seen, if people, when people really look and, and focus on what is whole, in the end, also in the physical, often the problem is not anymore there. It disappears without it having disappears. to be solved. Yeah, because the energy doesn't go into the problem. So you may all also see maybe a problem is a perception. A perspective, a certain I'm way sorry, of seeing. Sorry, a, percep a perspective, right? Not a, perce a perspective. 